I don't care if this shatters my masculine bravado because we need to rewrite the narrative on what it means to be a strong man and expressing our emotions and seeking help. These are signs of strength, not signs of weakness. So I'll say it. I cried inconsolably. I cried and I cried and I cried until there were no more tears left for me to shed. So that was rock bottom. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome to another episode of Kindred Stories with me, Kairi Jamaluddin KJ. And me, Shahril Hamdan. Welcome to Kindred Stories where we are here seeking knowledge and sowing kindness. Shahril, we had a great episode with uh, Mufti Mank recently. Um, well received, almost more than a million views. Uh, we also had uh, another great episode with Dr. Mariam Shabani. Um, today, another fantastic episode, but maybe moving a little away from the academic, the scholarly feel to something that I think is close to my heart and your heart as well. We've spoken about this on our other podcast on Malaysian current affairs and politics, Kluas Kajab, which is well-being, especially mental well-being and mental health. How are you anyway? I'm well, thank you. Yeah. Um, and absolutely agree. It's a topic about mental well-being, mental health, and it's how it sits within the broader framework of our relationship with our faith. Absolutely. And I think we're learning now as we grow older that those two things are not supposed to be contradictory. Yeah. And I think we have the perfect guest to try and navigate us through that particular dynamic. Before we bring him on board, I know he's heard this story many times already, but... I wanted to share with you how I came across our guest today. So in 2022, I was still working as at the health ministry in Malaysia and I was working as the minister. And every year we have to attend the World Health Assembly uh, in Geneva. So that's where all the ministers come together. We meet together with the senior officials of the World Health Organization and decide on international policies and strategies on how to uh, increase health well-being around the world and every year there's an award that's given and it's called the DG's award the director general's award and it's given to someone who's shown exemplary leadership in public health or in a field of health and for that year it was our guest and I can't remember the sequence exactly, but I think there was a speech virtually by Macron, the president of France. And after that, Dr. Tedros Ghebreyesus went up and introduced our guest. He said, this is the recipient of this year's Director General's Award. And our guest went up and delivered this speech. And you have to understand that, you know, General Assemblies, whether it's the United Nations General Assembly or the World Health General Assembly, this is these are very sterile environments. These are very stiff environment. This guy comes up, bundle of energy. I didn't know where the hell he came from. And he just came in enthusiastically, uh, told the story about his life as a wounded healer, which we will touch on later. And then he said, you know, I know that there are ministers here, dignitaries here, senior officials from government. I don't care who you are. You're all vulnerable. And some of you are suffering in silence. And you have to remember that this is 2022, just as we were coming out of the pandemic, many of us who are health ministers then were in charge of pulling our countries out of this once in a lifetime pandemic, probably battling with serious deep wounds and scars of our own. No one ever really spoke to us about our scars, not that we were asking or not that we were asking people to ask, you know, we're just not like that. But the moment he said that I, I broke into tears. I was thinking to myself, this guy, this guy sees me. This guy sees me, even though he's talking to the audience. But it was like he was speaking to me. And then after that, I immediately had to go up to him and we took a selfie and, uh, and we connected and we became friends after that. Now, alhamdulillah, he's here in Malaysia mm. and we've taken the opportunity of, uh, of him being in Malaysia to invite him on Kindred Stories. So welcome to Kindred Stories to my good friend, Dr. Professor Dr. Ahmad Hanker. Ahmad, welcome to Kindred Stories. Thank you so much. It's a blessing to be here. And uh, before we go any further, I'm just going to get the 
uh, the credentials out of the way. So so we know we know what's what. Uh, so I'm going to use the Instagram posting for one of your talks here in Kuala Lumpur. Honorary Visiting Professor, University of Cardiff, UK Consultant Psychiatrist in Canada and in the UK Senior Research Fellow, Centre for Mental Health Research in association with Cambridge University. You've worked for the NHS, uh, you've worked at South London, you've worked, uh, you are Senior Research Fellow uh, as I said, in Cambridge, clinical, academic clinical fellow in general adult psychiatry at King's College, London. You've researched and produced scholarly outputs and have had uh, pu public engagement, lectured to over 75,000 people in 19 countries, uh, and most recently visit, appointed visiting professor of academic psychiatry uh, in uh, in the States. Have I missed anything? That's a long resume there. I think that will suffice for now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but but uh, just for the record, you are now based in London, but not London, UK. That is correct. Yes, I am based in London, Ontario. There's in, a London in Canada. There is a London <laughs> in Canada where all your dreams come true. <laughs> <laughs> so, Ahmed, um, let's take things back to the beginning. We like to establish the origin story of our guests. Um, you were born in Belfast. Um, I was born in Belfast. Raised yes. in Dublin in England, but you're actually Lebanese. Yes. So tell us that story. Sure, sure. I often quote my mother when my parents, they migrated from Beirut to Belfast in the 80s. And my mother, she continues to say it was like jumping out of the frying pan and into the fire because in Beirut, there was this brutal and bloody civil war and in Belfast, oh yeah, there, there it was the troubles. Yep. And my mother said that the only difference between Beirut and Belfast at the time, and Be Be Belfast was considered one of the most dangerous cities in the world at the time. And she said the only difference between the two is that the Israeli occupation forces in Lebanon, they wouldn't call you uh, when they dropped a bomb or bombs or, or whatever. Whereas the IRA in, in, in Belfast, they gave you that courtesy call. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that's what my, my mother says. And I don't remember Belfast, but I do remember Dublin and I have very fond childhood memories of Dublin. And I shared this story with you recently about my twin bro, Dr. Mo. He yep. looks like me, dresses like me, might be the next best thing, but it's not quite me, not quite. And uh, he recently was interviewed by uh, Trinity College, Dublin, and they asked him, why, why Ireland? Why did you choose Ireland? He looks them, he looks them in the eyes and he says to them, you're asking me why I chose Ireland? I'll tell you why I chose Ireland, because no one ever called me a packy when I was living in Ireland. And he silenced all the... Uh, people on the panel, but he was, uh, they made him a job offer. The point I'm making is no racism. Yeah. Thank God, thank God for the Irish, right? Yeah. Thank God yeah. for the Irish. It was only when we moved to England that I noticed the complexion of my skin isn't white. And I lost count how many scraps I got into in fights, not as the aggressor. No, this was self-defense. I mean, I've always had an aversion to violence, but you have to defend yourself, right? So very So how, fond how old was this when, you, when you moved to England? I moved to England when I was seven years old. So Belfast, zero to two years, Dublin, two to seven years, and England, seven to 12 years. And that's when you encountered racism. It was, yeah. I mean, I lost count. I And I uh, discussed yeah. this in my book. I'll, I'll never forget my older brother at the time, some younger, some kids, some youth, they threw a stone at us and they were hurling racist uh, terms of abuse towards us. Paki is a term that we often heard. And my brother fearlessly, fearlessly picked up the stone and threw it back at them. And the next thing I knew, the kid was running towards my brother as fast as he could. And with all the power he had like a metal tennis racket and he hit my brother on his head and my brother, you know, he started to bleed. And, and I used to work in the emergency department and I know now full well that such a blow to the head could potentially be life-threatening. And 
yeah, that was like my, I guess my childhood in England tainted by the trauma of uh, of racism, unfortunately. I mean, there were positive experiences sure. as well. You know, I can't deny that. Uh, but, uh, you know, we, sometimes we feel forced to sanitize our stories and I, I refuse to sanitize the story. Doctor, um, I'm super interested to speak about and discuss with you about your relationship with trauma and tragedy. Sure. And I think that's going to take up a lot of our this, this, this first segment. But I was still curious and I'm still curious about that story that start from zero to two to Belfast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In Belfast. Any reason as to why parents moved from Beirut to Belfast yeah. and not somewhere else that was, you know, less fiery? Well, I think it was easier to secure a job in Belfast because not many people wanted, <laughs> wanted to work to there, right? Yeah. And mm. I think, you know, that was like the gateway to the UK. Um, because And that's what happened. My father moved from Belfast to Dublin and then from Dublin to England. So um, I think it really was that was the reason. That. Yeah. yeah, I mean, yeah. it wasn't so competitive. I think it's really important because a lot of people don't appreciate the migrant story and, oh, for and sure. why why sometimes people make decisions or or make these this moves that may from the outside appear odd, but actually has a sound reason to it. Yeah, definitely. And we have to remind ourselves that many people who choose to seek sanctuary or migrate, they don't do so because they want to. They do so because they have no other choice. Mm. Don't forget, there was a, a, a brutal and a bloody conflict raging in Lebanon at the, to- at the time. So to reiterate, it's not because they wanted to, but because they had no other choice. Sure. So, and it's something that my parents remain grateful for, yeah. that kind of that yeah. opportunity to, to, to move to the but UK. I'm a, I'm a, uh, after your, your dad spent time in the UK, correct me if I'm wrong, I, I'm trying to recall reading your, your wonderful book, Breakthrough, which we'll talk about later. Sure. You guys moved back to Lebanon for a while. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. So how how were things in Lebanon at, at, in you the nineties? A, a tragedy yeah. in, in Kana. In, uh, yeah, absolutely. In nineteen ninety five or ninety six. So yeah. my mother, in particular, she was getting homesick. extremely homesick. Yeah, which I is, remember you know, completely, this, yeah, yeah, it's completely yeah. understandable. Yeah. You know, like she was living in a small village in the you know in in the south of Lebanon and then one day my father the dashing doctor comes and sweeps you know her to he the sweeps UK. her off her feet yeah. my mother the beautiful bell and you know says let's move to the UK where money grows and trees and you know mm. and things like that right and <laughs> but i think you know the plan was always to return to Lebanon and so that's what they did and that was during the aftermath of the the the, the civil, civil war, war yeah. and I mean, I remember, even though we had some negative experiences, I identified strongly as British. And so I think I was resenting my parents, you know, like, oh, you know, how could you do this to us? You know, we didn't speak a word, word of Arabic. And in my book, I talk about identity crisis. So, no. you know, in, in England, you they didn't English. treat us as English, no. even though we, we were British uh, nationals or citizens. And then you go to Lebanon and the term that they would call us is Ajnabi, which is foreigner in Arabic. Mm. So we weren't treated as, Leb- as Lebanese. Right. So it's like, you were like left in the state of limbo. Are you too Eastern to be Western? Are you too Western to be Eastern? You have this identity crisis and that can render you vulnerable to developing mental health difficulties for sure. But yeah, we had to move back to Lebanon. Yeah, mostly because my mother was extremely homesick. Yeah. And it was challenging. I remember the, uh, the blistering heat. I remember the mosquitoes. I remember the... Uh, the the buildings were covered with bullet holes. We didn't have 24 hour electricity. There was only one road connecting the south of Lebanon to the to the capital, Beirut. My uncle would share stories with us. Like for example, he would have this uh, sky blue Honda Civic, and he'd be traveling from the south to the capital, and there would be Israeli warships in Lebanese waters, and it would just be my uncle versus the Israeli warship. And my f- uncle would like travel as fast as he could, listening to Guns and Roses. And <laughs> the Israeli warships would be, you know, aiming at him. And it's like, it's you versus the Israeli warship. You know, like this is our reality, right? Um, but as challenging as it was, I would say some of the happiest memories in my life, because this was before the fragmentation of the family. Yeah. And I think that's one of the most traumatic things that can happen to you. I, I wanted to uh, speak about why I said a couple of minutes ago about your relationship with trauma and tragedy. Sure. Because I imagine that that inspired so much of the good things you've done since, uh, Doctor. So I, I read a bit about 
what you saw in Kana and how yeah. you saw um, a father carry uh, his dead um, the remains, child, the remains, yeah, the remains of, of the, his family yeah. after the Israeli yeah. bombs rain on on that particular compound. Yeah, yeah. Um, I also saw afterwards when you then went back uh, to the UK and you saw a flatmate. Um, when you were living in Moss Side, I studied in University of Manchester oh, as well, did? by the way. Yes. So oh, wow. Fellow alum. Oh, so you know Moss Side, right? I know you Moss know Side. You know the Curry well. Mile restaurant? Yes, I do. I yeah, live you know there Fallow for Field a year. Okay, yes, wow. I know all this of that. Is, that's cool. <laughs> I know all of that. Uh, but I read that you saw a flatmate die uh, from overdose. Yeah, that's correct. So yeah. your relationship with trauma and tragedy has been numerous. To say to, the least. Yes. To say the least. <laughs> yeah, but yeah. here I see you now and use Kyrie's words, uh, b- you know, someone with full of energy. Alhamdulillah maybe begin to describe to us how, how you made the transition, how your relationship my, I think was. my immediate response to that would be, you know, transmuting the trauma, right? Because anger is often a manifestation of pain. Trauma can cause a lot of pain and you can sustain these wounds. But if you, the, the, the anger can also generate energy. And if you know how to harness that energy, to work towards achieving a goal, then that can be beneficial. I mean, I guess that's a long-winded way of saying there is such a thing as post-traumatic growth. Hmm. But that's a process that takes time. And also, the title of my book is Breakthrough. So initially, I might perceive something as a breakdown. but Then you breathe meaning into it that meaning making process helps you to refrain, to reframe what initially is perceived as a bre- breakdown as a breakthrough. Um, but that's, that's a journey and there's a lot of soul searching. There's, mm. there's, there's a lot of anger. There's a lot of resentment and there's a lot of bitterness as well. And cliche though it may be is true. I think the toughest battle you'll ever have is the battle that you have with yourself. You know, that kind of, that internal jihad, right? Um, so those are like my my immediate thoughts when you ask me about trauma and tragedy and and transmuting that trauma and post traumatic growth. But yeah, man, I still get traumatic flashbacks. You know, uh, I can't sit down here and say that I don't, and it haunts me like a ghost, like a malevolent entity. You know, and I mean, sometimes I'll just be sitting down, and it'll be, and that this can even be in my safe place my beloved crystal palace south east london and that's my safe place and even if in my if i'm in my sanctuary i can just be sat down and all of a sudden i'll you know i'll i'll jerk and if i'm sat with someone they'll say what happened i'll say i just had a traumatic flashback and it's intrusive and it's distressing and it's recurrent by its very nature so i can't say that i'm over it entirely you know we carry these wounds wherever we go. But, uh, you know, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, the phoenix has risen from the ashes, right? There's a fire burning in my belly and there's a thunder in my heart. I'm a man on a mission and I'm here to reject the stigma and I'm here to contribute, if not instigate, a cultural revolution that empowers and dignifies and humanizes persons living with a mental health condition. And we do that by harnessing the power of storytelling because a story is data with soul. That's a wonderful way of putting it. Uh, Thank you. Better uh, clip that for for a soundbite. Um, just to take us back to the 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 story. Yeah. Speaking of storytelling, so you went back to Lebanon. Yeah. Uh, things had calmed down by then, but obviously relatively, 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 yeah. Um, but were you one? Were you affected by the? environmental and generational trauma that uh, other family members had lived through throughout the civil war? Very much so. That was palpable. Yeah. And you'll never forget the look of despair in the faces of the fathers who were unemployed because job insecurity is real in Lebanon. Accommodation insecurity is real in Lebanon. Poverty food insecurity, things like that. And you know, as a father, you have that impulse, that instinct to provide and to protect. And if you can't provide, I mean, how emasculating is that? Yeah. And you see that look of despair in their eyes. 
that is, as I said, palpable. So for sure, that shapes my values. I mean, so if I go to the UK, which is what I did, and I was given a job to work as a janitor, cleaning floors on minimum wages, for me, that was like hitting the jackpot. Because I know back, back home in Lebanon that there, were, there are fathers who would literally kill to have that opportunity to earn an honest living. And so it, that, it did, in a way, make me more grateful those kind of uh, challenging experiences. But yeah, no, for, for sure, the pain was palpable in Lebanon because of the generational trauma. Yep. I mean, memories of Sabra and Shatila, the genocide mm. or that occurred in the refugee camps in Beirut when the Israeli military were occupying Lebanon at the time. I mean, those memories haven't faded. And that trauma is transmitted from one generation to the next, you know, without a doubt. Yeah, they, I mean, intergenerational trauma is real. And does that shape my outlook? Does that shape my worldview? Does that influence my values? Does that render me more vulnerable? People ask me what's happening right now in Gaza. Is that triggering the, tra uh, the resurfacing of, of traumatic memories? Of course it is. So... After that, you move back to the UK. And, yeah. and, and I, yeah. I, I wanted to ask you this because the UK, you had some happy memories, but you encountered racism for the first time when you were young in the yeah. UK, yet you still chose to go back there. You had a minimum wage job uh, as a janitor while you were doing your A's, if I'm not mistaken, That's A correct. levels, and you were trying to get into medical school before the breakdown happened at medical school. Tell us, what was that life like? Sure, sure. I mean, it didn't really feel like a choice. You know, I turned 17. And the situation in Lebanon back then was terrible. It didn't seem like, seem like there were many prospects. I mean, like following the largest non-nuclear explosion in history in Beirut, we see many people, especially men, w wandering, aimlessly wandering the streets of Beirut. And they call them zombies. Why? Because they've become psychotic. They developed a major depressive disorder with psychotic symptoms. Because there are no employment opportunities. So the situation back then, I wouldn't say it was as difficult as it is now, but to reiterate, you know, pros prospects weren't good. And so we had these British passports and we were like money grows in trees, right? Let's just go back to England and we'll, we'll be embraced. So we were following our parents' instructions, bless them. And we soon learned that our qualifications from Lebanon were not recognized. So even though I graduated top of the school that I attended, that I graduated from, my qualifications were not recognized. And because I, I fell through the cracks, it doesn't matter if you have a British passport. If you don't live in England for three years, you're not considered resident. If you're not considered resident, you can't enter university as a home student. And the international tuition fees were exorbitant. That wasn't an option. Plus... I wanted to get into medical school and my qualifications from, from Lebanon were not going to get me into medical school. I had to do my A-levels. So I was just told, we're going to set you back for three years, just like that. So usually when you're like 17, 18, you, you matriculate into university, right? That didn't happen with us. And to be honest with you, I'm still processing that to this day because that's never been validated. It's like three years, we'll set you back. That's it. That's, you know, you, you, that's non-negotiable. So that was one. Then having to do, well, I had to take a year out because A-levels would take two years. And so what do you do? Well, I don't have any work experience. Um, I w I'm what you considered unskilled, according to the far-right politicians, who are increasingly xenophobic. And obviously, you know, they were, they, 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 they were behind Brexit. I mean, you just remind me of this. I don't know if you know him, Nigel Farage. Yes. Yeah, you know Nigel Farage, right? You know that <laughs> far right fanatic. And he's like, you know, he's like, if you're an unskilled immigrant, is that, you know, like that's the worst thing that can, you know, that you can ever be. And that's why, you know, you're uns who do you think you are? So yeah, you, you feel very unwelcome. And so my first job actually was working in a van selling burgers and kebabs for a living in Malvern Hills, which is like in the Midlands. And that's when I witnessed my first homicide, um, which was that, that continues to, haunt me to this day. It's like, you know, welcome to the UK, right? Um, and then people will be like asking me, can you speak English? You know, there I am having these dreams of becoming a doctor one day and I've got people asking me if I can, if I can speak English. So it felt like it was so far-fetched. Um, but you know, Alhamdulillah, at least 
in the UK, education is a birthright and you have to be patient. So I, I did that for a year. Uh, I worked, I had two jobs. I was working as a janitor, cleaning floors in the morning and as a stock advisor, stacking supermarket shelves and filling fridges. And I was doing that 60, 70, 80, hour, 80 hours a week. Calluses on my hands, evidence of my manual labor. And, you know, I would, I would see other kids my age living with their parents, not having to work to survive. You know, and when you compare yourself to that, yeah, you feel melancholic, right? Um, but then if you compare yourself to the kids in Gaza right now, you can't help, you should feel extremely grateful. But I think it's important for me to share this quote with you. Saying to someone that they shouldn't be depressed because other people have it worse is like saying to someone you shouldn't be happy because other people have it better. And the point I'm making is never invalidate a person's distress because that can be intoxicating. Mm. Without validation, there can be little to no healing. So it, I came to that realization myself that you have to be grateful and you have to be patient. So yeah, I worked for a year stacking shelves, filling fridges, cleaning floors. I'd say good morning to people. They wouldn't say good morning back to me. I was naive. I was, I don't know, pure, I guess. Back then, I didn't think that things like class and race mattered. But class and race do matter, especially in England where many people have that kind of colonial mindset, like you are like beneath them because of the complexion of your skin. Um, but you know, alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, the following year, I enrolled into a sixth form college. I continued to work full-time hours to survive. And uh, despite the constant threat that working full-time posed, because I had to get straight, medical school is, sorry, medicine is the most competitive course in university. Um, but Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, I, I received straight A grades. And to quote the Lawrence of Arabia, all men dream, but not equally. Those who dream by night in the dusty recesses of their minds wake in the day to find that it was vanity. But the dreamers of the day are dangerous men, for they may act their dreams with open eyes to make them possible. Hard to follow that. Um, <laughs> but can I ask to, to like sort of interject as you tell your story and fascinating story. Sure. About two things. One is your relationship to the West. Yeah. Um, especially with, not just with the UK now, but also with Canada and how you see your space and place in it. Have you uh, made peace with it? Have, has it made peace with you? Has it, I, have, uh, has it accepted you as a, as a fully functioning member of civil society? Do you feel that? Because uh, you mentioned about identity and, and, and validation. And second question is, how do you balance between two extremes or two equally legitimate um, imperatives? One, to be grateful mm. for who we are and what we have, but also to recognize that we have trauma and we have pains that shouldn't be invalidated just because things are worse elsewhere. Bismillahir Rahman Rahim. My relationship with the West, my relationship with the global North. Complicated. On the one hand, I'm immensely grateful that I was given opportunities that I would not get elsewhere. I think of countries in the Middle East and North Africa, for example, and the, the biases that they have, well, it goes beyond biases. It's probably discrimination, right? If you, you know, if you're, I can think of a country in the Gulf, whatever, um, Qatar. If you're a Qatari national, then you have privileges. You have advantages that non-Qataris don't have. But that's not the case in the UK. And in that sense, I'm to reiterate, immensely grateful that I was given that opportunity. Okay, I had to work 10 times harder, but at least I had that opportunity, right? I'm not the only person of color to say that we have to work harder to secure these opportunities. It was traumatic. 
Goffman defined stigma as a deeply discrediting attribute that reduces the better from a whole unusual person to a tainted and discounted one. The individual is thus disqualified from full social acceptance. What is that deeply discrediting attribute? Well, we know that it can be race. And to say that racism doesn't exist is a lie. That's not true. It does. And I felt it. I really felt it. But a place can have many different faces. Mm. So you can be on minimum wage in the UK, stacking shelves, filling fridges, or you can be a consultant psychiatrist, uh, a professor, a physician. And it's like you'll see different fa uh, faces of the same place. Or, okay, so for example, Moss Side, right? It's a deprived district in Manchester. And when I'm on minimum wage, I have no other choice but to live in Moss Side. And you just, you, you just feel like your life expectancy mm. has reduced, right? Because of the social determinants, poverty and employment. But then as a doctor, I'm living in Didsbury. And it's a much, as you know, it's a much nicer area, to say the least. It's an affluent area. And so I got to see different, I mean, I, you know, when I was a forced time to drop medical school, I had to go to the job center and it's like, you go there and it's soul destroying and you're, it's like, it's a hand to mouth existence as well. You go to sleep in an empty stomach and to quote Bob Marley, a hungry man is an angry man, you know, and I was roaring with rage, man. You feel the pangs of, you don't go to sleep because the pangs of hunger keep you up at night, you know, but does that make me a more empathetic physician, psychiatrist? I think it does. I mean, who do you think I see at two o'clock in the morning in a mental health crisis? These are the people who have been rendered impoverished, who have been affected by the cost of living crisis. And so I can relate to a degree to their hardship and their trials and tribulations. So in response to your question, I'm grateful for the opportunities that were given to me in the UK. And I can't say that the same opportunities are available in other parts of the world. But I was actually compelled to leave the UK because of the bullying and the harassment and the racism that I continue to experience, uh, which it's flabbergasting. I mean, I'm, I'm tongue-tied and I'm usually loquacious. Um, the, the extent of that racism to the degree that I was compelled to leave. I, I don't feel it. Some, I mean, I've only been in Canada for a year now, but it, it, it feels a lot more diverse, certainly in London, Ontario. I mean, London, UK is diverse, but you know, when it comes to career progression and the people who were in power, it's not as diverse as it should be. Mm -hmm. Good. So, and then the second que uh, the second question was that kind of balancing was it the kind mm -hmm. of like yeah the the trauma and I guess the gratitude being, being grateful but also being yeah. able to express. I mean, I, I mean, I can't emphasize that enough because invalidating distress is intoxicating. And with little to no, sorry, with, with no external validation, there can be little to no healing. I mean, as a mental health care professional, as a consultant psychiatrist, as a wounded healer, I mean, that's, it's incumbent upon me to, to not only know that, but to act upon that knowledge. Um, and I can't impose that on someone. I, if, as I said in my quote, Saying to someone they shouldn't be depressed because other people have it worse is like saying to people they shouldn't be happy because other people have it better. So I shouldn't say to my patient, he's depressed, oh, you know, snap out of it. Or, you know, there are people who are suffering. No, that, that, that person receiving care from me needs validation, needs empathy, and they, and they need to come to that realization in their own, in their own time by themselves. Um, but we know that populating a gratitude diary is associated with a positive health outcomes. And there's actually a scientific study, a paper called Counting Our Blessings Instead of Our Burdens. And I mean, I was talking to Heide this morning about it. You know, what, what, did you populate your gratitude? I mean, there are so many things to be grateful for. You know, just being in my book, I say, having that cognitive capacity to receive and to, the, the mind's cognitive capacity to receive and to conceive ideas. It's something, something that should never, ever be taken for granted. I'm going to put that in my gratitude diary. 
And that's associated to emphasize, that's associated with positive health outcomes, mental health outcomes and physical health outcomes. So I hope that yes. answers you. your question. We're going to take a quick break and uh, come back right after this. Sounds Thank good. you. Welcome back to this episode of Kindred Stories with Dr. Ahmad Hankir. We've been delving into his upbringing, his background, some of the stories that he's had to share from Belfast, Dublin, the UK, Lebanon, back to the UK again. Ahmed, uh, I know you and, of course, I've read this fantastic book of yours and I want to plug this book right now. Thank it's so called Breakthrough, A Story of Hope, Resilience and Mental Health Recovery, Dr. Ahmed Hanker, which has uh, been produced by Wiley Capstone. Um, just published. Wonderful, just published. wonderful book. More than a memoir, I think. It's an instruction manual in some sense for, for me as well. I hope so. Um, really looking at defeating the stigma and how it's essential to treat mental health as integral for your entire well-being. But the whole genesis of this book, Ahmed, was what happened to you at university. I mean, that, that's really where this wounded healer, this this your your stage persona yeah uh, came about absolutely with wounded healer for those who haven't read ahmed's book dr ahmed uh, hanke's book refers to the fact that he is a psychiatrist who's been through a mental health crisis he's a wounded healer yes and that happened at university didn't it you had a you had a breakdown breakdown breakthrough there was a breaking point yeah what happened tell us about this lowest point in your life absolutely it was rock bottom and in my book, I talk about the insight switch as well. So as you rightly said, I identify as a wounded healer. I'm both a mental health care professional, a consultant psychiatrist, and I'm a person living with a mental health condition. I was once a psychiatric patient. And that, of course, is nothing to be ashamed about. So despite the perception that health ministers, world leaders, doctors should be invincible, the reality is that we are human beings, we are fallible, and we are also vulnerable to developing mental health difficulties, like everything else. And I feel that by being honest, open, and transparent about my mental health experiences, that can help to reject the stigma. Medical school. Medical school was brutal, man. It's, I mean, this is really intense, I know, but it's no exaggeration to, to state that I was psychologically tortured in medical school, I remember having to having to take a year out. I was forced to interrupt. And for a long time, I was in denial, despite the conflagration in my wake. In the metaphorical sense, I was burning bridges with people who at the time I thought were my closest companions. And in the literal sense, the Bridges in Lebanon were burning because of the Israeli military. And as I mentioned, I was in denial, but then the insight switch turned on suddenly, abruptly, and I was overwhelmed with the realization of what happened. And I don't care if this shatters my masculine bravado because we need to rewrite the narrative on what it means to be a strong man and expressing our emotions and seeking help. These are signs of strength, not signs of weakness. So I'll say it. I cried inconsolably. I cried and I cried and I cried until there were no more tears left for me to shed. So that was rock bottom. And I looked at all the damage and seemingly it was beyond repair. And I felt so isolated, lonely, and afraid. And in my despair, I contemplated ending that which is most precious, human life itself. But Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, by the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I was deterred from acting upon that seductive suicidal impulse because suicide is forbidden in Islam. So Islam was and remains a protective factor and contributed to my mental health 
recovery and continues to contribute to my mental health resilience. But for sure, for sure, that was rock bottom. And recovery was a slow and painful process that took many, many years. But until you have that insight, you can't begin that process. And what contributes to the denial is the internalization of the stigma because you feel so ashamed. You, you perpetuate those negative stereotypes. Only weak people have a mental health condition. Only those who have a proclivity for violence have a mental health condition. And these are myths that we need to debunk. Having a mental health condition doesn't mean you're weak. It doesn't mean that you have weak iman. People who have the strongest iman are also vulnerable. The Prophet Muhammad Wasallam, he experienced emotional turmoil when he discovered that Hamza, anhu, when his uncle, his body was mutilated, there are reports that Muhammad Wasallam cried inconsolably. Are you saying that the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam had weak iman? Of course not, he had the strongest iman. But he, oh, he too was vulnerable to emotional turmoil. So it's debunking those myths that weak persons have mental health difficulties. Actually, if anything, it's actually made me more resilient. It's made me more driven and it's made me more insightful. Alhamdulillah, he rabbil alameen. But uh, yeah, I was glad to get out of that hellhole that they call medical school, which definitely expedited my recovery. Hmm. Doctor, you mentioned in passing just now a bit more in pass, more than in passing about how Islam and your faith mm. uh, provided. This is my words, not yours. Maybe a safety net so that it didn't go. Your despair had had a flaw. Um, maybe speak a bit about that and how how that saved you. Absolutely. Thank you for asking. It's an important question because Islam is an integral ingredient of my identity. You know, I'm I'm proud to be a Muslim. It's a blessing to be a Muslim. Inshallah, I will be a Muslim. I don't know what ha will happen in the day of judgment. If my book will be given to me in my right hand or my left hand, only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows and he is the most merciful. You know, khutrat is shaitan. You know, the, the footsteps of the devil. Mm. You know, you deviate from sirat al mustaqim. Yeah, so it's the straight path. The, the path of righteousness, the straight yes. path. And it's so gradual and it's so imperceptible that you don't know how far you've deviated from that path. And then one day you behold your reflection in the mirror and you become unrecognizable even to yourself. And you feel so ashamed because once Islam was central to your life and now you have deviated so far away from that path of righteousness. And that can render you vulnerable to developing mental health difficulties. And that's exactly what happened to me. Why? Because you go to the global north. And I'm going to say this. I'm going to say this. I'm going to be direct. Society has become sexualized. And the sexualization of society, the ubiquity of vice, of sin, it all can, it can, it can derail you. And it's all normalized. It's not, even, it's, not, it's not only normalized, it's promoted. And this is incompatible with Islamic values. So those were some of the vulnerability factors. But then you have to remind yourself that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most merciful. And when I go for a run with you this morning, it's an opportunity for me to remind myself. I, I always say this, and I will get emotional now. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you are the most merciful. Ya Allah, you love to forgive those who repent with sincerity. So please forgive me for the sinner that I am. Astaghfirullah al And when you remind yourself of how merciful Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, how the whole of humanity can, you can feel forsaken and they can judge you. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, his mercy is limitless. It's actually a grave sin, isn't it? To impose a limit on the mercy of Allah. You can't. He is the most merciful. And when you remind yourself of that, that's when you can short circuit that 
when you, because when you're at the throes of a major depressive disorder, you can develop excessive guilt and you ruminate. Rumination is when you like have a broken record player in your mind mm. and you have that kind of scenario and you self-flagellate and, and you punish yourself. And by reminding yourself that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most merciful. And if you go to Allah, if you turn to Allah with a mountain of sins, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the most merciful, will turn to you with a mountain of forgiveness. All sure. you have to do is repent. What an opportunity this is to, 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 go, to go nearer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so that's how Islam contributed to my mental health recovery. But we need to be very clear mm. that Islam is not enough. We need to be holistic. And we also need psychotherapy, for example. And if necessary, if there's something wrong with the hardware, then we would initiate psychiatric drugs. So we need to be holistic. We need to have that social connectivity. And that's the beauty of Islam because Islam encourages you to go to the masjid and you, are, you receive even more reward if you, play, if you pray in congregation. Can so I these are all like examples of how Islam Jump helps. in there, Ahmad. Yeah, I absolutely. mean, you know, I, I have heard of certain people hmm. who say precisely what you alluded to earlier. When they seek help, they may not see a medical professional first. They may see their imam because in Muslim societies, the imam is someone who's revered. Imam is the community leader as well. Trustworthy. Trustworthy. And sometimes, I'm not saying all, maybe a small minority, will start saying your iman is not good enough. Yeah. And that's why you're experiencing this. Yeah. And just pray some more prayers and read some more Quran. and Pray some more. Yeah. Read more Quran. Then you'll recover from this. Sure. Does not that deviate from what you're saying here? I mean, of course, faith is important, but okay. not seeking help from medical professionals. Okay. And what if you had appendicitis? Yes. And what the imam would, would the would the would the uh, imam say to you? Pray more. Pray more. Or would you say go to the uh, hospital and see a surgeon who might actually consider doing an appendectomy if it's an appendicitis? Yeah. I mean, that's what's heard, doesn't it? You wouldn't say someone who has abdominal pain and who you suspect has appendicitis go read some more Quran and go pray some more prayers. I'm sorry, it gets me upset because that's the disparity of esteem. That's the stigma. That's the ignorance. This is a health condition that needs care and compassion in the same way that a physical health condition like appendicitis does. So, and any imam who does say that needs to have first aid, mental health first aid training, which I think is currently being rolled out in Malaysia. Yeah. So you have to be very clear about that. I mean, I, I have just said to you now that Islam is beneficial for my mental health, but we need to be holistic. It needs to be more than just praying more prayers, reading more Quran, going to the masjid. We need to go see a family doctor. And if necessary, the family doctor will refer you to a consultant psychiatrist for further assessment and treatment. I mean, I, there's a bit in your book where you were, so we, we've now talked about the role of faith, that it is integral, but it has to be accompanied by people who know what they're doing in this case, medical professionals absolutely yeah. in fixing you and your analogy with physical illness was I think spot on just give us a little bit about toolkit for recovery I, I mean I, I I just stumbled across this again I, I read this a couple of months ago and I, I opened it this morning and I remember your chime framework oh yeah, yeah, yeah. connected connect, connected this hope and optimism identity meaning empowerment and this was like a mnemonic for a framework of personal recovery and mental health. Sure. Maybe share with listeners and viewers, what toolkit can you teach them yeah. or share with them? I mean, I can tell you what I did. Yeah. Absolutely. And in my notes, in my psychiatric notes, I start off with lifestyle interventions. I think the threshold for prescribing powerful psychiatric drugs is too low. I think there's a lot we can do you mean psychiatrists prescribe it too quickly? Too mean? quickly, absolutely. That's what I mean. Okay. No, thank you. Yeah. yeah. I think they get their prescription pads out too quickly. I think there's a lot we can do before we prescribe powerful psychiatric drugs. I'm not anti-psychiatric drugs. I'm anti-prescribing powerful psychiatric drugs when it's not necessary. So I can't emphasize enough. I think there's so much we can do 
before we get our prescription pads out. And that usually starts at the level of the individual. Lifestyle interventions, what is that? Physical activity. I mean, I, I can't, I mean, the importance of physical activity for our mental health can't be overstated. And I get it. I understand if you are at the throes of a major depressive disorder, you just don't have the motivation to, to even anything, get out of bed, yeah, yeah. you know, let alone go for a run. And that's, that's why you need something called behavioral activation, because you would just start off by at least getting out of bed. And that is a monumental achievement. That is a victory that should be celebrated. And the next day, do more than just get out of bed. Get out of the house. And then the following day, walk down the street. So that's something called behavioral activation. You just do it gradually. And I mean, I was a slouch on a couch. I was, my BMI, I was morbidly obese because I resorted to comfort eating. And that made me even more miserable. And I managed to snap out of it using behavioral activation. And now, alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, every day I go for a 15 to 20 kilometer run because I know how important that is for my mental health. And it gives me that confidence as well. So, and then also diet, nutrition. And we know that there is a relationship between gut health and brain health. Sure. So modifying your diet, increasing physical activity. It's a blessing to be able to engage in physical activity. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, that's not a blessing that I, I should take for granted because I know that there are many people who are unable to do so and my hearts go out to you. But so that's, that's lifestyle interventions. And that's what I did. Uh, and I'll share this with everyone. I don't take any psychiatric drugs. And Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, I have remained relatively stable for over 10 years now. My faith, the social connectivity, having social connections. And it's not so much the quantity of those connections, it's the quality of those connections. And all you need is one high quality social connection. In the same way that Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu anhu, in the, same that he, in the same way that he was able to confide in his wife Khadija when he beheld the spectacle of angel Gabriel commanding to him to read. And he returned home trembling in fear, asking his wife to cover him with sheets and she would comfort and console him. All of that is necessary for mental well-being. And then for me, it's the power of the performing arts to be able to recite poetry to an audience, to reenact scenes from famous films, improvisation. And that's what the wounded healer is. I pioneered the wounded healer which has been described as an innovative method of teaching that blends the power of the performing arts and storytelling with psychiatry. And my argument is that in order to engage an audience, you have to be able to, well, in order to educate an audience, you have to be able to engage with them. And if you want to engage with them, you have to entertain them. Tell a story. For, for, with, yeah, but absolutely. Because a story, you can engage the mind and the heart. And so I trace my recovery journey. I share my story, but I also reenact scenes from famous films, from Pulp Fiction, The Dark Knight, uh, Blade Runner, The Last of the Mohicans. That's pretty eclectic, man. It's pretty eclectic, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, no, it is pretty eclectic, yeah. for sure. Even books, uh, you know, that passage from Khalid Husseini, A Thousand Splendid Sons, Let Me Tell You Something, Maryam, About a Man's Heart. It is a wretched, wretched thing. It isn't like a mother's womb. It won't bleed. It won't stretch to make room for you. Remember that. So that really did contribute to my mental health recovery, and it continues to contribute to my mental health resilience. So to summarize... Lifestyle interventions, physical activity, nutrition, diet, social connectivity, and all you need is a one high quality social connection, your faith, and for me, the performing arts. Can we go back, doctor, to the word that you've mentioned a few times, stigma? Sure. Because thank you for that toolkit. I think um, our listeners and even myself will try and apply that as oh, much as we can. And therapy, therapy, where? therapy, 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 therapy. In the same way that there is no hesitation to meet with a physiotherapist, if you sprain your ankle, there should be no hesitation to see a psychotherapist if you sustained an injury to your mind. And I can't emphasize that enough. And not only does therapy help to heal wounds, also 
it gives you a, a deeper insight into your personality structure. Do you know how many younger people, not even younger people, how many people in general do not know who they are? They don't know what their vulnerabilities are. They don't know what their strengths are. And that's the beauty and power of therapy because it, you can develop a deeper insight and it unlocks that potential. So therapy. I think that's a great segue into mm -hmm. Cheryl's point. Yeah. Because Cheryl and I, and, and I guess Ahmed as well, you guys are in your 30s. I'm in my uh, 40s. Um, but we grew up in a cultural environment where therapy meant something wrong. Yeah. Whereas you, you've just explained it, not just as seeking help, but also in trying to optimize performance. That's how I'm interpreting your, 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 the second part of what you said. 100%. It's yeah. optimizing performance. It's optimizing performance. Just, it's maximizing performance. Just like Ronaldo would go and see his physiotherapist because he's an elite athlete and he does it with his body. We do things with our minds. And if we're not seeing our physiotherapist in terms of our mental health professional therapy, then we're not performing to the standards that we should be performing. Is that is that right way of, of describing what you said? It's... 100% the correct way of describing what I said. But now, many Premier League players don't only have a physiotherapist, they, they, also, have, yes, they have a psychologist sure. now. Yeah. And so, I mean, I can't emphasize that enough. There should be no shame whatsoever in seeking help from a therapist. I mean, even the All Blacks, they dominated, they continue to dominate world rugby. A tiny country, in the Southern Hemisphere, population, what, 5 million or something? Mm. What did they do? They consulted a, actually, it was actually a consultant psychiatrist because he helped them to unlock their mind's potential. And look what they did. They dominated, they are dominating world rugby. They even, even Arsenal Football Club, I don't know if you have any Gunners here. I think some people, I can see some United supporters here. But the Gunners, Arsenal, they also consulted a psychologist because they respect the power of the mind. I thought we they are just, utterly they, beholden to the you, power you of the mind. You want to say something moment. funny, right? Yeah, they yeah, they consulted on. because yeah. they're depressed. They've never won a trophy in recent years. So anyway, sorry. <laughs> yeah, all right, okay. Yeah. <laughs> but sorry, you were going to say something. Sorry. Yeah, no, just, 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 just taking off from, from this question of stigma. Yeah. And I think you've, you've already, you know, many times in this interview, described why we shouldn't subscribe to that stigma, but maybe share your experiences in combating the reality that there's yeah. still a stigma, not no, oh, just, yeah. and especially from the Muslim community, if I can say that, yeah. right? So, what, I mean, if you look at the Lancet Commission in mm. 2023 on ending stigma and discrimination, I mean, the evidence is clear. The most effective way of rejecting stigma is through social contact with someone living with a mental health condition. Yeah. Why? Because when you might have preconceptions that this person, like someone living with a mental health condition has a proclivity for violence or that they are weak or that they are doomed to underachievement. But when you meet us, you discover we are law abiding, community serving, peace loving citizens and that we have hopes and fears and strengths and vulnerabilities and dreams like everyone else. You discover that we are human beings. And it should be nothing about us without us. At the moment, it's everything about us without us. But it should be nothing about us without us. And what I mean by that is we need to amplify the voices of persons living with a mental health condition. So thank you. I salute you both providing, for providing me with this platform to amplify the voice of a person living with a mental health condition, to debunk myths and to contribute to this cultural revolution that empowers, dignifies, and humanizes persons living with a mental health condition. And... It helps to reject the stigma because I didn't become the only psychiatrist on the planet to receive the World Health Organization Director General Award for Global Health despite my mental health condition. I'm the only psychiatrist on the planet to receive that award because of my condition. I'm, I'm going to ask you a potentially sensitive question. Sure, ask away, man. Again, at the risk of having preconceived notions and generalizing, but... I've always thought of the Arab world as a very masculine world. Oh, yeah. Oh, God, yeah. So I, I, I'm going there Oh, now. my God. Go there, man. Uh, yeah. we, so, we need so, to go there. Man. So there's, there's this sense of toxic masculinity. 
There most certainly is. In, in the Arab world, maybe even in the Malay world, uh, I think. Mm-hmm. Maybe not, not okay. as much as the Arab world. Yeah. So let, let's have this conversation let's talk, amongst, we need to have amongst three guys. Yeah. About three this, blokes. Three yeah. blokes about toxic masculinity and, and what it is, what it takes to to talk about feelings. I mean, is this, is this, this again a stigma, right? I mean, where we, we come from very, very masculine, macho society. What, the bravado? Yeah, the bravado. Yeah, and we were, we were politicians, so that's even more. Well, even we, we, we cannot, yeah. we cannot. We're not supposed to talk about feelings. Because why in, not? in our twisted mind, it, it's, a, it's, it's a sign of vulnerability. Vulnerability, weakness. We don't want to show that there's a chink of the armor. Well, I mean, I would argue that vulnerability and weakness are not one and the same, and that we need to embrace vulnerability. Toxic masculinity permeates our world and some communities more than it does in others, especially the Middle East and North Africa. Why is it that the male to female suicide ratio is three to one? Three male, one female. For every one female that dies, three men die by suicide. Every suicide, by, every suicide, irrespective of gender, is tragic. To quote John Steinbeck, it's a sorrow that weeping cannot symbolize. But why is it that for the male to female suicide ratio is three to one? Why is it that more men are dying by suicide? Why? But I'll tell you why. Because toxic masculinity is contributing to suicide, suicidal behaviors in men. What is toxic masculinity? We are discouraged. We are deterred from expressing our emotions and seeking help. Why? We are are human beings too. What did Paddy Pimblot say? What did Paddy Pimblot, the UFC fighter (laughs) say? Remember what he said? Did you see how hurt he was? Because his mate, he discovered that his mate died by suicide. And after the bout, which he won, he spoke with emotion and with authenticity and with vulnerability. And he said, I'd rather my mate cry on my shoulders than go to his funeral next week. There's a stigma and we need to reject it and we need to have this discussion. So I remember, alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen, when I received the Caroline Flack Mental Health Hero Award in the UK. It was a star studded event. It was televised by this Channel when you met 4. AJ. This is when I met this is when I met Anthony Joshua, affectionately known as AJ, the former heavyweight champion of the world. And I was delivering my acceptance speech. And King Charles, he also presented at this award ceremony. Rishi Sunak was there, but that's not very impressive. More <laughs> impressive is Scary Spice was there. Mel B was there. That's more <laughs> impressive than Rishi Sunak. I can tell you that. And in my acceptance speech, I quoted Marvin Gaye. Heard it through the grapevine. Now I know a man ain't supposed to cry. Well, Marvin Gaye, respectfully, I disagree. We need to rewrite the narrative on what it means to be a strong man and expressing our emotions and seeking help. These are signs of strength, not signs of weakness. And guess who gave me a standing ovation? None other than AJ himself. Why? Because when he lost his second fight against Usyk in Saudi Arabia, He he cried. And there were segments of the media that criticized him. Yeah, and when I, I said that. to him, you remember that, right? Remember they he criticized, cried. he yeah. cried. Why? Yeah. Because he wasn't born with a silver spoon in his mouth. He was born and raised in Watford yeah. in some council state. Yeah. And that was traumatic for him. And losing that fight triggered the resurfacing of traumatic memories. Why? Because that trauma re- remained unresolved. And when I said that we need to rewrite the narrative on what it means to be a strong man, that inspired the former heavyweight champion of the world to stand up and to give me and to clap. And then that's when I made eye contact with him and I confessed my undying love towards him. I'm like, yo, AJ, I love you, man. <laughs> so the bromance was palpable. It was interesting. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grabbed me, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted for me to meet with him. So somebody grabbed me by the arm. I don't know who it was. And they just led me to his table. And he was sat next to Mel B. And she was dignified. And she's like, Dr. Hankir, Professor Hankir, please sit next to AJ. And AJ greeted me with a smile. There's a picture of me on the internet with my arm wrapped around the former heavyweight champion of the world. And he kept on saying to me, books, books. Professor Hankir, how many books have you read? He was humbled by my knowledge. Why? Because the Prophet Muhammad said, the ink of a scholar is nobler than the blood of a martyr. The ink of a scholar is nobler than the blood of a martyr. And he said, what inspired you to give that acceptance speech? I'm like, do you want to know what inspired me? I'll tell you what inspired me, AJ. Because before I went on that stage, 
I went and I prayed my maghrib and I had my forehead on the ground. He's like, you prayed? I'm like, I prayed. He's like, that humbles me. The former heavyweight champion of the world said to me that I humbled him through the power of prayer. So we need to rewrite the narrative of what it means to be a strong man. And when you embrace your vulnerability, you have these authentic connections with other people. Just quickly on that, I mean, I'm a huge boxing fan and I've been seeing since the second Usyk defeat where, you know, he just broke down. Yeah. He couldn't understand why he couldn't beat Usyk. And, yeah. you know, that, that, that trauma came to the surface. But he's thriving now. He is. You know, after he saw you, after he went through that valley, he just beat Francis Ngannou and he's, he's looking like he's going to be champion again. I he mean, is. This is a breakthrough that we see in AJ. Very much so. And I wouldn't be surprised if he's actually seeking therapy. Yeah. That looks like a man who has healed his wounds are healing because I told you he, he was, he was raised in poverty and that is traumatic. And if you don't seek help, if you don't see a therapist, that trauma will remain unresolved and it will influence your mental health. It will influence your performance and it will influence your interpersonal relationships. I want to continue this chat a bit about, you know, three blokes speaking about <laughs> yeah, we're masculinity. Just three um, I imagine we can all agree that men today, one of the difficulties is figuring out how we want to be seen. And toxic mas masculinity is perhaps one option, which we know of all these pitfalls and why it is negative and why it is bad. How do you suggest uh, the male in today's world positions himself to be seen, not in a toxic way, but in a way that asserts his masculinity and doesn't fall for the other extreme, which is basically an ungendered uh, situation where maybe uh, not all men want to go. I'm a believer, man. I'm a believer. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. Ashhadu anna Muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluh. You know what that means? It means that I accept. I bear witness that there is no deity worthy of worship of Allah. And I bear witness that Muhammad Sallallahu is the messenger and the last prophet of Allah. And he is my role model. It's simple as that, man. I want to emulate my paragon. How do I want to be seen? How I, I should want to be seen in the same way that the Prophet Muhammad um, was seen. He was humble, self-effacing, a man among men. He would go to the marketplace and there wasn't a single person that he wouldn't smile to. And he would spend the night praying, crying to the extent that his beard would be drenched with tears. So it's the balance between that kind of vulnerability, but also the masculinity as well, because he was the leader of his household. He was the mm -hmm. leader of his community. He was the leader of the Ummah and he will be our leader on the day of judgment. And what are the, what are the characteristics yeah. of a leader? The truthful one. He spoke the truth. The, 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 when, he keeps, when he makes a promise, he keeps his promise. When he argues, he doesn't insult. When he's trusted with uh, something, he doesn't betray that person's trust. So how we want to be perceived as men, what better mm -hmm. role model, exemplar do we have than the blessed Prophet Muhammad I mean, I shared this once. The how many beautiful hadith do we have? Remember when somebody came and gave the Prophet Muhammad a gift, some grapes. And he was with the Sahaba, he was with his companions, but he didn't share, you know this hadith, beautiful hadith, he didn't share the grapes with his companions. And his companions are dumbfounded. Mm -hmm. They know Prophet Muhammad they know how generous he is. And when the person gave him the grapes, when he left, and they asked him, why didn't you give, 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 give us, why didn't you share the grapes with us? Because he said, these grapes were sour. Mm -hmm. And I was smiling throughout. And I was concerned that some of you might express your displeasure because of how sour, sour the, the Prophet Muhammad was concerned about the feelings of others, of others, the feelings. How beautiful is that? What better role model? So in response to your question, I am reminding myself to learn more about the character, to, to learn more about the character of our blessed Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu who is the personification of masculinity. Hmm. Wow. That fantastic note, we're going to take another break and come back right after this. Mm -hmm. 
Welcome back to a fascinating episode of Kindred Stories with uh, me, Kari Jamaluddin, my partner, Cheryl Hamdan, and wonderful, wonderful guest, my my good friend, Dr. Ahmed Hankir, consultant, psychiatrist, as well as a mental health survivor, mental health patient. Ahmed, I wanted to move the discussion to broader themes in the Ummah, at Kindred Stories. Our theme is seeking knowledge, sowing kindness, telling stories to Muslims around the world sure, and sharing stories with Muslims around the world. And your story has been really, really fascinating. I wanted to talk about this um, paper that you wrote, a talk that you gave, Canaries in a Coal Mine, Islamophobia and Muslim Mental Health. Here you provide information about what it's like living in the global north where, of course, Islamophobia thrives to the extent where it has impacted generations of Muslims there. They carry this wound, they carry this trauma, which they're not even aware of yeah. because they live in societies which are sometimes uh, anti-Islam. And canaries in a coal mine for listeners and for uh, viewers of Kindred Stories, that it alludes to how canaries were used in coal mines to detect carbon monoxide. Yes, that's correct. Early mm. warning sign. And that's why you use that phrase, I guess, canaries in a coal mine. I was quoting Dalia Mujahid actually in her TED talk. Yeah. Although we are the first to feel it. So Muslims are like canaries in a coal mine. Yeah. Although we are the first to feel it, the toxic fumes of fear are harming us all. M Muslims and non-Muslim alike. Yeah. So Islamophobia, it is deadly. Look what happened in Christchurch. I used to work as a psychiatry doctor, registrar in New Zealand. And I was invited to, to deliver a talk at a conference in Christchurch. And I prayed in Al Nur Masjid where the atrocities occurred. And many of the Muslim brothers who I prayed side by side with were killed. So to emphasize Islamophobia can be deadly. I mean, we know that it's associated with psychological distress. Professor Jonas Kunst, my dear friend at the University of Oslo, developed and validated the perceived Islamophobia scale. A decent sample size, over 1,400 participants, all of them were Muslim, recruited from the UK, France, and Germany. And he revealed that there is now, this is an empirical study, data to prove that Islamophobia is associated with psychological distress. So we must do everything in our collective power to combat Islamophobia whenever and wherever we see it, online, in schools, in our communities, and to go back to what Goffman, how he defined stigma as a deeply discrediting attribute. So being a Muslim can be considered a deeply discrediting attribute. And then there's something called intersectionality, when you have layer upon layer upon layer of deeply discrediting attributes. So mm. if you're a Muslim man of color living with a mental health condition in the global north, that's mm. the triple stigma, that's the triple whammy. But it's also an opportunity for us because we can make contact with non-Muslims and we can share the beauty of our deen. And when people make contact, when non-Muslims make contact with Muslims and they discover that we are not these beasts and we don't have this kind of whatever preoccupation with harming others. On the contrary, we want to serve. We want to heal. We want to help. We want to blaze trails in our wake. But isn't it tiring, Ahmed? Because it's not like the global north hasn't... It's, it's not like the, this is the first time the global north has encountered Muslims. Muslims... <laughs> have been living in the global north for generations. For, for generations. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's yeah. tiring, isn't it? It's have exhausting. To, to have to remind them that, you know, ours is a religion of peace. Yeah. We come in peace. We, we mean well. Islam is a force for good. Yeah. Uh, I mean, is this, uh, a, a, are we a broken record? That well, I mean, it can seem like that, but then we remind ourselves of the, the Prophet Nuh and how many centuries was he trying to promote mm. the message of Islam. So I agree with you, it is exhausting. And 
it's not only incumbent upon us to notify others, uh, but also others must be receptive to our notifications and our messages. But it is exhausting. And I think we have to be mindful of how exhausting it can be. And we need to also be moderate in our approach as well. And it's important to be consistent, isn't it? So, um, but we, we will be judged. Are we doing enough? Hmm. Are we harnessing the power of social media to combat Islamophobia, to spread the message of our beautiful deen? Because to emphasize Islamophobia can be fatal. So we can't be quiet. Now is not the time to be quiet. Now is not the time to rest. In the Akhira, there will be plenty of reckoning and inshallah rest for the believers, but not in the dunya. Doctor, I guess Islamophobia is not just potentially fatal um, in a literal sense, but I can imagine for young people facing Islamophobia, there are various reactions and responses to it. Sure. One of which could be to dilute one's Muslimness or one's Muslim sure. identity yeah. because maybe that's a surviving uh, or coping mechanism. So I completely agree with you that's incumbent upon us who may have some influence yeah. in society yeah. Yeah. to try and combat it. Maybe share your own view of your own responsibility. Somebody in your field uh, with an audience, how are you f combating it day to day? I mean, alhamdulillah, rabbil alameen, I actually developed this well, I was fortunate to co-edit a textbook on Islamophobia and psychiatry with uh, Dr. Dr. Rania. Dr. Rania. Mm -hmm. Yep. And also we had uh, Professor Steve Mofik, who is a Jewish man, who actually is more vocal about challenging and combating Islamophobia than many Muslims are mm -hmm. about combating Islamophobia. He's certainly more vocal about combating Islamophobia than Muslims are about combating anti-Semitism. And as Muslims, actually, it's incumbent upon us to challenge all types of Discrimination. religious hatred, including anti-Semitism. Um, so I was fortunate to contribute to this textbook. I was a co-editor. And in Charlotte now we're going to um, prepare a second edition of Islamophobia and psychiatry. And I actually developed this anti-Islamophobia talk called Canaries in the Cold Mile. And it helped because I'm a consultant psychiatrist, I'm a professor. And now that talk, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, has been integrated into the medical school curriculum of Cambridge University, mm -hmm. which is one of the leading universities in the world. And it was also actually, I was in John Radcliffe, um, a Khairi uh, graduated from uh, Oxford University, and John Radcliffe is a teaching hospital for Oxford. So the point I'm making is that people are actually reaching out. These are non-Muslims. It's good. And part of the diversity and inclusion yeah. is to integrate these talks into the uh, into the syllabus and into the curriculum. So that's one way. But also harnessing the power of social media and it could be sharing this podcast. Mm. That's how you as an individual can combat Islamophobia by harnessing the power of digital, te digital technology. But I think also you're right. You have to know where you are in your journey mm. because now that I'm more senior and I'm more accomplished, I don't feel as vulnerable as, for example, if I was an early career psychiatrist or if I was a medical student, because we can't be oblivious. Mm. We can't be naive. In the same way that mental health related stigma exists, so too does Islamophobia. And it might be that, for example, you are canceled or you are <laughs> not given the same opportunities to progress with your career because of being a Muslim. I mean, I... I'm going to ask you a question that we've been asking some of our recent guests, and this is to do with the genocide that's happening in Gaza. Yeah. And I think it's apt to ask you this question because you were a child of a country that was emerging from decades long conflict in Lebanon. Yes, absolutely. And you spoke of the intergenerational trauma that you still carry with you today. This trauma that young Muslims are exposed to today because of the genocide in Gaza is something I think that will be very, very difficult to cure or even erase. Yeah. And you're not just talking about 
young people, of course, in Gaza, they have it the worst. And we pray to Allah that they will be saved. I mean, I mean. But Muslims everywhere absolutely yeah. are, are carrying this trauma. They are. For those of us who are slightly older, the trauma and how we respond to it may be a, a little bit different. But for a young, impressionable, adolescent, teenager, someone in their 20s, this is going to scar them. This is going to make them angry. This is going to radicalize some of them. Yeah. How would you, as someone who has that background, but also a medical professional, advise or speak to young Muslims today who, who are watching this horror, mm. the greatest horror in their lifetime, yeah. feeling helpless apart from being able to post on their Instagram, all eyes on Rafa, is that all I can do? Mm. Well, I think it's important to validate their feelings and emotions. I mean, I, I said it before, often pain, often anger is a manifestation of pain. You know, I can, I, I can understand why they are angry because of the injustice. And we talk about this, I guess, in a political sense, in a political sense, no justice, no peace, but also in a psychological sense. Like if the perpetrator evades accountability, then there will be no peace of mind. Yes. Mm. And we see the horrific scenes emerging from Gaza and Rafa. I mean, I think, first of all, I think we're more traumatized than we realize we are because the mind does mount these defense mechanisms. And to reiterate, I think we are more well, traumatized. What do you mean the mind has these defensive mechanisms? It's like, um, yeah, for example, um, denial or uh, minimization or repression and suppression because you have a distressing thought, feeling, or emotion in the conscious mind. And what you do mm. is you bury that in the unconscious mind because it's too... It's too upsetting. Do you think that's what's happening with the leaders in some countries in the West where mm. it appears that it doesn't affect them? No, I think they're heartless. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I agree I think with that's you it. No, I think they're heartless. Yeah. yeah, there's a difference between being in denial and being heartless, for sure. Um, and I think younger people in particular, because their minds are still maturing and their brains are still developing, that it's just too upsetting. And... I think it's important to reach out to younger people and validate their thoughts, feelings, and emotions. But also this is an opportunity to remind ourselves that this world is a test. Now, it's, it's easy to forget that. But you look at some of these people, children, in Gaza at the epicenter and how grateful they are, even though they are being tested because their iman is so strong, mm. because for them, the dunya is nothing and the akhirah is everything. But unfortunately for many people, the dunya is everything and the akhirah is nothing. And so you see how resilient and how strong their iman is mm. in Gaza. And it's inspirational. And I think we have become too attached to the dunya and when you become too attached to the dunya, that can be problematic because we forget about the akhirah. Okay, maybe the perpetrators will evade, accountabil uh, evade accountability in the dunya. But as Muslims, we believe that they will not evade accountability in the akhirah. So it's, it's difficult. Of course it's difficult. To, to see what we are seeing. But also we have to normalize disabling notifications because the human mind and the human heart can only witness so, so much, much in humanity. So especially for the younger people, don't feel so guilty about, even if it's only temporarily, disabling the notifications because it is extremely distressing. But my message to younger people is, I understand why it hurts. I understand why you are angry. I know that there is so much injustice to say the least, but remind yourself that this dunya is a test and after hardship there is ease. And when you read the Quran, we know that the recurrent themes in the Quran, that there will be hardship. And 
that we have been endowed with intellect and that we have a choice. These are the recurrent themes and the three recurrent themes in the, in the Quran. So we have to remind ourselves that there will be hardship, that we are being tested. But we must be patient. And inshallah, after hardship, there will be ease, inshallah. And we have to do everything that we can at the moment. Donate to charities, raise awareness, but also be careful. Because unfortunately, there is a climate. It's become so politicized. And many people are getting cancelled as well. So I'm not saying you shouldn't be vocal. No, absolutely not. We should protest peacefully. Um, but also, we need to be careful and cautious as well. And protect your minds. And an example of protecting your mind and your heart is by temporarily disabling notifications so that you don't continuously see these horrific scenes emerging from Rafa. Um, so my, my, my last uh, question to doctor, um, I guess going back to where we started and about yourself reflecting on your journey, many, many more years, inshallah, uh, inshallah. In, of, of your contribution to all the things that we've spoken about, mental well-being and, and all the rest of it. Um, I wanted to maybe end on a more personal note, seeing as to how we began this conversation with your relationship with trauma and mm. you saw very, very difficult things and you went through difficult experiences in your youth. Where are you now um, in that journey? You feel settled? Is settled even something we can call uh, about our mental well-being or is it always an evolving situation? Um, and maybe end there and, and say, you know, what are your hopes for your own journey in the future? We plan and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala plans. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the best of planners. I'm a sinner, man. I can't sit down here and say that I'm a saint. I am reliant on the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So I need to constantly praise Allah, be in remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The most important connection that you'll ever have in your entire life is the connection that you have with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So I talk about physical health, I talk about mental health, and I talk about spiritual health. And a good way to assess your spiritual health is by focusing on your prayers. Am I praying my prayers on time? Am I praying the extra prayers? So where I am at the moment, it fluctuates. But having that kind of consistency, going for a run every morning, attending therapy, praying my prayers on time, all contributes to my resilience and my stability. I'm extremely grateful it's my duty, it's incumbent upon me to give back as, as much as I can. But not to my own detriment as well. You have to have the strength to say no and, and, and know when to say no. Here I am in Kuala Lumpur. It's a blessing to join you. I'm obviously trying to promote my book as well because I think it can be a companion. Because I think there are many people, especially Muslim people who are disconnected and who are isolated and who are lonely. And I hope that my book Breakthrough can be a companion for you and that it does plant the seeds of hope into your heart, mind, body and soul, that recovery is a reality for the many and not for the few, inshallah. And my story is for the evidence to prove that. Not only can we recover, but inshallah, we can even realize our dreams so don't give up hope and don't ever take hope from someone because often hope is all they have left put your trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to younger people never stop believing in yourself never ever stop believing in yourself and with hard work and with forbearance and fortitude and determination inshallah ya rabbal alameen you will overcome the adversity and you will realize your dreams, inshallah. And to, to close, in a world where we can be anything, be kind. I'm 
Cheryl, I... Um, I, I promised, I promised him on this trip that, um, that, uh, as part of my personal growth and, and recovery, he, he mentioned Solat, he mentioned, uh, physical fitness, well-being, and he mentioned fixing the mind and the, the heart and the soul. I think the first two, inshallah, I think I can, I can manage the third bit. I've not really attended to it properly. And, and we've spoken about this a couple of times. And I told him on this trip, I said, you know, I think I'm ready. Ready sure. meaning I'm ready to, to embrace going to therapy. Alhamdulillah. Not Alhamdulillah. just about dealing with trauma and dealing with the deep reservoir of issues that we face, but I think looking at it positively to perform at a more optimum level for myself, for my family. I think I can be a better person if I do this. And um, thank you, Ahmed, for, for that. And I, I just wanted to end by saying I, I took Ahmed to the National Center of Excellence for Mental Health mm. this morning in Malaysia center that's run by the public health division in the ministry of health and he met with our great staff working there and i just wanted to promote and plug the 15555 mm. that's their heal crisis line so we'll put that in the show notes but we know that kindred stories we reach out to a global muslim audience so there is a crisis line wherever you stay mm -hmm. So if you are in the depths of your despair, like you were once. I was. Um, yeah, please reach out. Yeah. You must reach out. Seeking help as a sign of strength and choose life. Yeah. Choose, choose life. life. <laughs> seek help and, and be kind. And I, I just wanted to also plug uh, what Ahmed said just now was, has been his labor of love for the last year or yes. so. Breakthrough. Wonderful book, wonderful book. And, and please go out there and buy this. And uh, thank you, Ahmad. Thank you for being on Kindred Stories and just thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Thank you for having me. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you, Doctor. Can I also end by thanking KJ actually, um, before we end the show. You know, Kairi, and it's funny saying this on, on a recording, you will always be inspirational to a, a large segment of Malaysians, especially. Of course. And I'm very, very, you know, happy that you shared that vulnerable moment mm. a few minutes ago. Um, I had no inkling that that was coming. And that's going to be important, not just for you, uh, but important for the many, many people who see you as an inspirational figure. Absolutely. Um, in this country. And hopefully that op also opens up more uh, willingness among people uh, Muslims, non-Muslims, male, non-female, uh, uh, to seek therapy, um, not as a last resort, but as something more normalized in this country and beyond. So thank you for that. Thank you, thank you guys. Amazing. Thank you.